Hey everybody. Not watching this from home or wherever you, you happen to not be watching this from makes no difference to us. Um, Huckleberry wanted to join me this evening. Here he is looking cute. Don't be fooled by this harmony right here. Huckleberry and I, Huckleberry and I often bicker like an old married couple. Um, He's making a liar out of me right now, but in general, yeah, we're like, I'm usually like, get off my nuts, let me breathe. I don't, I don't have the energy to scratch you right now. I have to make lunch or I'm going to pass out. I cannot stop to scratch you right now. It's usually like that. And yeah, anyway, you get the drift. So I do have things I wanted to talk about. Um, first and foremost, I listened to the interview uh, that Elon Musk gave at the Milken Institute, and I'm not familiar at all with this organization, so I'm probably gonna just you know look into them, see what they're about. It was a fun, lively, mostly light-hearted interview. One thing that struck me as odd, though, is when um, these interviewers ask more personal or intimate questions when they're reading it off of a fucking note card. It's just weird to me. That might be that guy's style. I don't know. I don't know much about that guy. I just, usually when I have a personal or intimate question to ask somebody, especially like, you know, what keeps you up at night, I don't need to read it word for word from a note card. It's like driven by curiosity. So I'm not gonna forget it, in other words. Anyway, that's just me and mine. I could be mistaken. Delightful interview. If you have, um, I think it was like 15, 20 minutes long, maybe 30, you can find it on X and listen to it. It's, it's a really fun interview. I got a lot out of it. Very informative too. So I wanted to dive back in to Bobby Kennedy's campaign just a little bit. It's something that I forgot yesterday. I wanted to address it. It's regarding potential peace with Russia. I firmly believe that Bobby Kennedy and Nicole Shanahan are our best shot at developing a, a peace plan, an actionable plan, a logistical plan with President Putin to move forward. And I think, like, if they are elected to office, I think not only is that manageable within our lifetimes? But within their tenure, within their first four-year tenure, I think it's very, very doable. And quite frankly, it's exciting. I I would love to, to why well, I mean, I can travel to Russia, I'm sure. I don't know if it's, you know, the State Department's putting out phony alerts and warnings that the FBI and the CIA should be putting out for Americans on American soil, but aren't until they get in front of Congress, Chris Ray, about three weeks ago, right shortly before they re-upped FISA, Chris Ray in front of Congress. Uh, an attack on American soil is imminent. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Um, way to be an MVP for the other team. I've never heard that before. But anyway, I I do I think that Bobby Kennedy is our best chance, our best hope at peace with President Putin. Um, I think both of these men have lost tremendously during their lifetimes and um, have used their experiences to not to the detriment of their countrymen, but for the betterment of their countrymen, whether you agree with everything they've done. You know, you've got um, uh, Bobby Kennedy, I almost called him President Kennedy. Um, there are no accidents, um, but you've got Bobby Kennedy who is very candid about his addiction. Um, and then we've got President Putin who is by and large perceived and um, regarded, really is probably the better word, as a war criminal and a fascist and a human rights violation mill, um, which obviously the media and the Twitter files, yeah, have 
pretty much kind of discredited that argument, at least to some degree. Um, for me, Tucker Carlson's interview, or I can't really call that an interview, um, shit show, mockery, when he went over to Russia to interview President Putin, that was like, that was the big censure. I think that because of Bobby Kennedy's experience of staring down the federal government, that that might somehow give him, I guess, maybe more credibility in President Putin's eyes, I would hope. Um, I, I'm sure I'm sure it's a day that ends in why that President Putin and his staff hear from dignitaries and diplomats the world over. Oh yeah, we're we're totally looking out for you, President Putin. Yeah, we love Russia and get off the phone. Blow him up. Um so I I would imagine that President Putin is probably going to respond maybe a little more enthusiastically um, than with previous overtures from previous politicians. That's my hope. Like, I, obviously, Bobby Kennedy's not a hack. He's an insightful human being. He's a learned human being. He has a proven track record of winning virtually impossible cases or cases that are said to be impossible. He's taken on cases apparently for um, for plaintiffs who could not obtain legal representation. Um, so I, I, I mean, I imagine, I would have to imagine that President Putin um, has to be to a large degree somewhat of a situational thinker. Um, so I, I can't, I can't see that not being uh, attractive in welcoming or responding positively to any overtures that the uh, Kennedy Shannon Shanahan, the hypothetical Kennedy Shanahan Oval Office, would would bring to the table. Um, I mean, you've got if anybody could relate with Putin. Bobby Kennedy comes to mind. Bobby Kennedy's father and uncle and beloved cousin were assassinated by the government. The, the government's never been held um, accountable. And despite that, Bobby Kennedy, by all appearances, is a forgiving and um, loving human being. Now... Let's look at President Putin. Oh, he's a monster. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I was enlisted for 20 plus years. And even though President Putin is the arch enemy of everything America, you know, better dead than red, as my asshole stepfather would say growing up. Um, by and large, enlisted. I feel like I've say, I'm saying by and large like 20 times a day now. It's really annoying me. So I'm just going to say it every chance I get now. By and large, um, my enlisted friends and I, even though we had this readiness posture towards Russia and Russian interests, we little peons don't walk around like, oh, I hate President Putin. President Putin said, so no, it's not, it's so impersonal. Like it is so, imp it's even impersonal with the, the personnel in armies of other nations. Like it's just so impersonal. Like, so the people that I know, the people that I have in my circle, we don't, we don't walk around. We didn't walk around 20 plus years ago. Like, oh God, the Russians are coming to inspect our nukes at Whiteman Air Force Base. I hate the Russians. No, it was nothing like that. In fact, the pressure was intense to come across exceedingly professional um, to have all your, your T's crossed and all your I's dotted. Um, it, I mean, 
This was not an event to show up like you had shined your fucking combat boots to the goddamn melted Hershey bar. No, no. When the Russians were coming to inspect the nukes at White Men, we knew it. And in general, you were expected to be in uniform. And that phrase meaning look... Um, have the appropriate wear of uniform. Anybody can put on a uniform, right? But there are certain um, rules and regulations that you'd have to adhere to in uniform as an actual military member, particularly a peon. So yeah, we we would. It was not. It was not like, hey, the Russians are coming. Let's let down our guard and just be sloppy and let them know that they're the enemy. No, it was nothing like that. It was very. I never interacted with any any of the Russian parties because I was just a little peon. Why would they have anything to do with me? I, uh, The closest I would have gotten to any kind of interaction would have been through the medical PRP office. And even that would have been like, yeah. Let's put it this way. The asshole that worked in PRP at the time, the narcissist, um, she probably she probably manufactured a reason to insert herself in that group. 100%. Total fucking... Total fucking type. Anyway, not the point. They didn't give a shit about a peon in the records room. They really didn't give a fuck. Um, but we... Yeah, we were buttoned up and um, we were expected to know our programs. You... Compare that to what you see in Congress when Lloyd Austin testifies. Let me give you a reenactment. Uh, well, uh, uh Senator Cotton, um, uh, I would tell you that I, I'm not sure what the ramifications are of, um, of detonating a, a, a nu nu uh, nu nu nuclear missile, as he stutters to read it from the script. You know, that would not fly. No, 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 no. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> long story short, nobody I knew in the military, certainly not now, nobody was like, oh, President Putin's the enemy. In fact, in many ways, um, I would say of most Americans, my the people that I tend to, like militarily tend to gravitate towards and my friendships and my relationships. Um, and this is also multi-generational for me because I'm from a multi-generational career military background. But um, we tend to think, if not very impersonally and um, just not much thought, just kind of like indifference but not an active indifference um some of my friends and i have mm, not bad uh i would say not negative perceptions of president putin no in many ways we look at him in contrast to our own leadership yeah lloyd austin testifying in front of congress now, Congress is going to play it up like Lloyd Austin is just pff, knocking the fucking ball out of the fucking park. No. If an enlisted peon like me bumbled through their fucking program like Lloyd Austin during an inspection, uh uh. As DeMarais would gesture, yeah. That's like, it's not even, it's not even like, oh, fuck, go memorize a reporting statement and you have to report to the commander's office. It's basically, in this day and age, for airmen, I can't speak to other branches, it's a career ender. It is. Very much so. <laughs> and here we have this retired multi-star, was he four-star? I don't give a fuck. Michael Scott star, um, in front of Congress, day in, day out, ooh, ooh, ooh. I, I heard a, um, testimony this morning, I was shaving my cooter, <laughs> I was like, why not listen to Lloyd Austin, um, oh my god, oh my god, I, nepotism, it always reveals itself, so, 
Bobby Kennedy, Nicole Shanahan are our best hope, in my humble fucking opinion, for a probably rapid um, peace plan with President Putin in Russia. I think I think it's possible. President Putin, that I kind of trot off. He is somebody, whether you agree with him or not, um, he's somebody who has also suffered greatly. He never met his eldest brother. His eldest brother died, was starved to death as an infant um, during the siege of Leningrad. And he, President Putin had to fend for himself. President Putin's father um, went missing. Uh, he either, I don't know if the the wiki page says that he deserted the family or if he went missing, but honestly, if he deserted the family, I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he was abducted and killed, but I'm not saying he wasn't, um, cause that happens too. So President Putin is in war torn Russia Fending for himself. You better believe he could have used a big brother. <clears throat> so imagine, imagine the insult of trying to reach some kind of semblance of peace with people. There are people in this world who were still alive, who played a heavy hand in the same siege that President Putin's brother died in. Yeah. Um, and President Putin has still made attempt after t attempt to um, negotiate or broker some kind of peace agreement. Too long didn't read. Bobby Kennedy and Nicole Shanahan are our best. Are they our best fucking um, shot at peace with Russia? And oh my god, that would be so fucking exciting! I think we would see an explosion of prosperity tourism uh i i can't even imagine what kind of products we we might be able to enjoy out of russia that'd be really fucking cool um anyway anyway gotta grab my pen so i can scratch this off the thing i wanted to talk about the atv gang in kansas city i'm just calling it an atv gang there are these people they use all manner of motorcycle type things like, you know, three wheelers. I've seen motorcycles. I've seen four wheelers, whatever. Insert fancy acronym here. Let's talk about the ATV gang. Now, if you've never lived in a poor neighborhood, a ghetto, a hood, um, what I'm about to say might fly over your head, and that's okay. Like I'm not, I'm not sharing it to be snotty. Um, it's something that I actually have to actively think about too. Even though I have, from time to time, lived in poor neighborhoods, if you want to call it a ghetto or a hood. Um, so this ATV gang in Kansas City, they, they are from what I've seen, the several times I've seen them. Um, Mad Maxing the streets of KC. They are males. My assumption is that they're military age. They're they're definitely old enough to be operating um, those vehicles, and you know they they have manly bodies. So I'm assuming they are not children. They look like man, even though their faces are concealed by helmets. Um, sometimes, not always, um, how old that goes, I can't imagine it's, you know, beyond 30s or 40s, because these guys are doing some pretty fucking cool stunts. These are not slouches. Now, the last time I saw them was Westport. I was leaving one of my favorite, um, my favorite places, my favorite lounges. It's a hookah lounge. And Westport, in that, that little stretch of Westport, Westport Road, it is a very tight, narrow, congested street for Kansas City standards. And for those, those people on those, um, those ATVs or whatever, they were doing some pretty sick maneuvers. 
right? If I hadn't been concerned about public safety, thinking like, wow, you could, you could seriously hurt or kill somebody um, doing that easily, easily. Um, they, they give the impression that they might be either stunt drivers or professionally trained they're all very, very fit in appearance, which lends itself to the agility and athleticism of some of the stunts that they're doing. Um, I'll tell you what, when I was living in, in <laughs> Bethel Manor, Ghetto Manor, we'll just use Ghetto Manor as an, um, an example. I can't think of a single one of my friends and I who had access to an ATV or a four-wheeler and not only that, but had the time to practice on it. And time is money. So I find it hard to believe that there's this critical mass of young men from Prospect who are marauding on the streets of Kansas City causing trouble. I think these are not kids from the ghetto. These, nah. These are people who have access to the resources, the vehicles themselves, the time for training. Now, if you look at the people doing the stunts, they are very athletic and very wiry looking. I can tell you for a fact, having lived in several poor neighborhoods, having had to lose weight, to meet shield for thankless civilians. I had to lose weight because I was chubby. Guess what? Most of my friends were overweight too. And if they weren't overweight, they had some kind of malady like asthma. That's, that's a big one. Not a lot of kids that I grew up with had the money for training, for the equipment, the nutrition. So here we have Kansas City, where apparently, apparently, by a miracle of miracles, we found that the only 20 young men from the hood who somehow seem to be athletic, potentially professionally trained, money and time to train because that that's very costly too um these don't sound like people from the ghetto now if you're in kansas city let's say this friday night and you step out of your favorite fucking hangout just like i did several weeks ago and you see these guys and you think oh my god those people from the ghetto are at it again. Look, I'm not saying the ghetto's perfect. I'm not. Not by a long shot. But I am saying... That's some poor people... That is some rich people shit. Yeah. Being able to train and... And they're, they're no slouches. Like, I, I literally wish that I could teleport people not watching this from home to that little stretch of road on Westport. So you could see what I mean by how agile and stealthy these guys are. Yeah. If they're, they could be amateurs, but I'm going to posit that they are not. I think they are professional drivers based on their, their level or complexity of the stunts that they do, the danger involved with the sense that they do and the confined spaces that they do them in. Um, things that come to mind, we have several military bases, uh, several army bases. These could be military personnel who are trained on that equipment for tactical operations. That makes a lot of sense to me. These could be people who race ATVs, um, dirt bike racers. That makes a lot of sense to me. People, people who have the time and the money and the access, and not just that, 
but the physical fucking agility. I cannot understate the athleticism of this group of marauders enough. So here's my verdict. They are 100%. <laughs> I think not from the ghetto. No. 100% not. I, I, I would bet my entire life savings, all two cents of it, on these are some rich kids with access to some really nice fucking things. And guess what? Kansas City Police does nothing to stop it. So that would kind of reinforce my hypothesis that these people might have some um, covert affiliations that we don't know about, that the Kansas City Police might not want us knowing about, that the, the FBI field office in KC might not wanting us know about. Yeah, that's never happened. The CIA has never used blockbusting block techniques ever. No, not ever. Not during Levittown. Or Levittown. Or the other Levittown. Not in Camden. No, never. They've, CIA has never done that. Not in Kensington. No. Not the CIA. They're totally harmless. So that's my little plug on the ATV gang. And also they're corny as fuck. Like, oh my God. They're like, seriously, they are not from the hood. Nobody I knew growing up. Like I, I went to Del Valley. Uh, for people not watching this from home, Del Valley Junior High School is actually pretty close to the Tesla Gigafactory. Oh my God, did I say it right? I think I said it right. It's pretty close to the Austin, Texas Gigafactory. Not all, but many of my classmates came from really poor fucking backgrounds and really not great neighborhoods. I mean, I don't know. I can't attest to Del Valley now, but when I was living on Bergstrom back before it closed, um, Del Valley was pretty dicey. Yeah, it was pretty gross. Um, anyway. Nobody I knew had that kind of equipment, time, money, um, access to physical training based on the athleticism these guys are demonstrating. Oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, if it weren't for the danger factor of pedestrians and, and passersby, it would have been cool in a controlled environment to watch them. That That's how athletic and agile these guys are. Um... Anyway, I'm going to cross that off my list. Look, I made notes. Yeah. Man. If you were if you were a newscaster like Kaylee McEnany, could you imagine if Kaylee McEnany showed up and the teleprompter was not working or the teleprompter people went on strike? <laughs> oh god, that would be fucking epic. Oh my god. If I were the richest person in the world, I would pay somebody to do that. Okay, I probably wouldn't, but I would daydream about it and I'd probably laugh for hours. Um, I wanted to talk about something called clerical celibacy, right? Um, we hear about celibacy in the like Catholic church. They're not the only uh, religion that adheres to clerical celibacy and of course, not religion, denomination, or religion. There are other religions that adhere to that. I always used to think growing up, why? Why can't they have kids? That doesn't make any sense. That's so weird. Why can't they, why can't they have sex? Why can't they do this? Why can't they do that? Um, and then I learned about the Borges and realized what bullshit that is. Let me tell you the purpose that the vow of celibacy serves, in, in particular for the Catholic Church. So, stand by. I love this stuff. Oh, my God. It feels like, it feels like lip gloss. Oh, my God, it feels so nice. Mm, anyway, imagine this. You're living in, I don't know, fuck, 
Florence. You're living in Florence, Italy. Went there one time as a kid. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely magical. You're living in Florence, Italy. It's 1452, whatever. I don't know. It might have been a good year for port. I don't know. But it's 1452 and you're shuffling off to mass. It's like nine o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. You were totally out. Uh, partying with all the winches at the local tavern and now you've got a fucking headache and a hangover and then you go to mass and there's the priest or maybe it's a bishop I don't know who gives a fuck um there's the priest and the priest is like we need donations alms for the poor put money in the bread basket that kind of shit and they they pass around the offering plate and people are putting money in. Okay, I got to give this priest money. And then that hungover guy, who's a little bit salty, that he's sitting in that pew at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning when he should be back home at St. Mattress on Spring Street. He says, wait a second. Why am I giving my guy or my money to this guy? When I got three kids at home that I got to feed and I just used my funny money for Saturday night. No, this guy doesn't need my money. Why does he need my money? I'm not gonna pay for his family. That's exactly why they have the vow of celibacy. It is a facade. The Borgias, I mean, this is common knowledge among historians. This is hardly conspiracy theory, what I'm about to say next. The Borgias were um, infamous um, for their children and their progeny. And what's more, they did not hide it. And that's not uncommon for that time period. That many popes took on mistresses, had children, their children had children. That's what the vow of celibacy is for in general. I, obviously, for some little pocket religion that I know nothing about, okay, I, I can't, I can't, I can't project that onto that if, if I know nothing about it. But for the Catholic Church, the vow of celibacy was to protect protect future generations of popes their children their offspring to ensure to ensure their livelihood and their estates and their wealth yeah we are literally we are literally paying for the descendants of popes that's now, am I, am I going to argue that there is nothing to gain from the vow of celibacy? Oh, no, not at all. I, full disclosure, I have not had intercourse, um, I don't know, three years now going on. It's over two. Um, there's something to be said for not having a love life. I mean, if I were 20, okay, different story, but there's something to be said. Your energy gets poured into other passions and hobbies. I find, I find, you know, your mileage will always vary. Um, but in general, logistically, the purpose that the vow of, vow of celibacy has served is to um, keep hidden what is in plain sight. And that is that going back to the Catholic Church, that parishioners are literally paying in to the wealth of descendants of popes and bishops and things of that nature. So yeah, it's um it's pretty pretty fucking captivating. It's it's easy to want to think that these ideas, this doctrine and dogma that it came from this divine source of inspiration. And perhaps that's the case for some things, but a lot of these rules can be easily explained for like a functional purpose. And that is the functional purpose that um, 
that the Catholic Church in particular has deployed, um, for which the Catholic Church in particular has deployed the um, vow of celibacy. Um, the vow is, you know, keep it on the down, though. That's the vow, really, if y'all want to know. And, it, of course, there are priests who don't do that, too. This is, I'm not trying to generalize here. I'm just giving some clarification on what might seem like an arbitrary rule that God threw out there actually was very logistically planned and oriented. Um, ooh. Oh, I got so much to talk about. Oh, Joni Ernst, Senator Ernst, I believe she's from Iowa. She is full of shit. Senator Ernst came out, it was probably about a month ago. Uh, she came out with a public service announcement called I Give a Shit. She was testifying on the, the floor of the Senate and holds up, or rather had some unpaid intern hold up a a sign, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. And it was like a 1-800 number to get in touch with Senator Joni Ernst because she cares and she's tired of this government corruption. And so if you're somebody who's been impacted by government corruption and you're not getting any feedback or assistance from your elected official, call this number because I care. My name's Joni Ernst. Um, Joni Ernst failed the litmus test with flying fucking colors. Joni Ernst never reached back to me. Um, I will not accept from anybody, senator or otherwise, that Captain Kevin Larson's CIA assassination is not worthy of a return phone call. That's where Jody Ernst stands with me. She's another piece of trash politician who is helping run the fucking Stasi racket that Congress has been, had going at least as far back as 1989 when President Bush, big Bush, not the baby Bush, when President Bush pushed that legislation through Congress, the Whistleblower Protection Act. It's more aptly called the War Criminals Protection Act because that's exactly the purpose that it serves. It serves to not out war criminals, but out courageous military personnel who are simply doing the job that they're required by Congress to do in the first place. Um, Joni Ernst does not give a shit. You want to find out? Call that fucking ass nine number that she got behind on the floor of the Senate. I'm Joni Ernst. I'm so good Nah, Joni Ernst is bought and sold just like Josh Hawley, just like Lindsey Graham, just like Elizabeth Warren, just like Joe Biden was back when he was a senator. Yeah, they're all bought and sold, y'all. They're all bought and sold. Um, they Basically, they are literally, the Senate almost exclusively is acting on the will of their top tier donors, BlackRock, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, PricewaterhouseCooper. I could keep going. Blackstone, there's another one. Yeah. That's who they're, I don't care what they say on Fox News or NBC. It makes no difference. And guess what? Guess what these people, guess what these elected officials who just love their constituents. Guess what they use the legacy media news outlets for? You, do you guys want to know who's watching that shit? Commanders? Military personnel on the floor of a skiff? Politicians working from home waiting for their invisible ink orders? Oh yeah. That's who's watching that shit. That's why it's still on. That's the only reason why legacy media is getting any airtime. Because they need it. They, that's where they get their marching orders from. That's one piece of the puzzle. They also use the indie journos on Rumble and Locals, the big time ones, to do the other piece. Um, yeah.
Joni Ernst doesn't give a shit, y'all. Didn't see that one coming. <sighs> I look forward to giving her the old courtesy copy later later on tonight. Um. So, I have some food for thought. When Tucker Carlson is interviewing these guests, particularly in his studio, particularly the masked guests, like Cat Turd, how do you know he's not Cat Turd, y'all? I'm not saying he is. In fact, I don't think that's the case. I am saying, how do you know he is not Cat Turd? You don't know that any more than I do. Let's talk about Cat Turd. Cat Turd likes to post um, TikTok videos of young women and Gen Zers crying and being upset. And yes, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's comical and fucking melodramatic and asinine as fuck. And sometimes it's not. But here's the fucking rub, y'all. Cat Turd is very happy to give these people airtime with their faces uncovered and call them out. Let me call him out. Oh, how convenient it must be able to say that from behind a goddamn mask. How convenient. So when you're tuning into Tucker Carlson, don't assume that the masked person whose identity is blurred out isn't Tucker Carlson. Oh, he can't do that. He can't be in two places at once. Do you know how easy it is to do that? Really? Do you know how easy it would be to edit that? Very easy. Very fucking easy. And it would be hysterically funny if true. I mean, it like if that were true, I would just die laughing. I would... I would I would die laughing in the way that Moliere died coughing. If you know anything about his death, it's very fucking ironic. Just some food for thought. Don't rule it out. Um, let's talk about espionage in families. So espionage, like I mentioned yesterday, it tends to run in families. Um, for reasons that that bond between fa father and son, mother and daughter, father and daughter, mother and son, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, family, long-term friend, that bond is very, very, very hard to break, even with a, a patriotic allegiance. Very, very difficult to break that bond for obvious reasons. It's, it's a... I mean, the bond between parent and child is divine, really, if you think about it. Um, so, anyway, one thing to keep in mind with these um, f families that play into the espionage apparatus, um, they tend to, and not overtly, but they tend to manufacture relationships for their children. So just hypothetically, let's say Tucker Carlson's dad needed to keep an eye on Tucker, not the case, but let's just say Tucker Carlson was like a really, really cool dude, right? Really good guy, um, really great heart, real sense of integrity. Well, they would have to have some kind of apparatus to make sure he doesn't <laughs> accidentally stumble on the family fucking jewels, if you know what I mean, and then have a reaction to that. So, to some degree, well, you could also ar argue by virtue of their their um, their schooling and their enculturation, they're getting, they're being socialized with people that maybe mommy and daddy feel comfortable because those people know the score. Um, and they know how to behave and they understand the customs and, and courtesies. Um, children of God. Let's talk about the myth of children of God. We keep hearing about children of God as if it's this little cult in the woods. It's nothing of the sort. Children of God are... Basically, a 
elite operatives. They are, I mean, the best way to, to, to explain them is they're like the unsullied. I don't know if I just said that a few seconds ago. Pardon me if I did, but they're, they're very much like the unsullied in Game of Thrones. Meaning, even though they do monstrous things, they've literally been brought up in that environment from cradle to grave. So they don't know any better. They're the more sociopathic, the better. Now, what happens is, um, let's say particular politicians, they <clears throat> they tend to groom and abuse children, unfortunately, and they break them down over a series of years emotionally, spiritually, um, even physically, because you have to, you have to factor in the physical abuse, but also the rampant sexual abuse and the, the ties that one has to their, their body and how that connects with their sexual identity. Um, very, very, very sad. Uh, they basically raise these people to be assassins and operatives from a, a very, very young age. So this, when you hear children of God, don't think about, you know, some backwoods outfit. It is not like that at all. It's, it's very well organized. They, it's basically elite pedophiles grooming people basically what it is um and then they're used at a later time as cogs in the machine that keeps the the machine going absolutely disgusting fun fact so it would have been right around the time that i got arrested in august of 2022 was right about the time that i realized oh stepfather got the job so rewind I think it was 2017 2018 I was visiting my mother in Lynchburg Virginia and my stepfather had had a couple of beers and I think I'd been I think I'd had a beer or two um or I might have been watching my weight for my fucking PT test because that's basically what I did for <laughs> for like forever um my stepfather proceeds to tell me this story and I never, like, I was just like, what? He told me that his, his parents, when he was a small child, would get him and his brothers together. And they would go camping. And his parents would allow people to drug them and sexually abuse them. I had no idea about this, like... The entire time that his parents were alive, I was very close. In fact, I considered his mother my grandmother. I was very close to her. I had no clue. I knew she'd struggled with alcoholism, and when I was about 15, she got sober. And same with his father, my, my step-grandfather. Uh, I had no idea that this went on in their household. And I didn't even, and I did, it didn't occur to me to sit and unpack the implications of that either from the perspective of a, let's see, I can't math. I think I was late 30s, early 40s. Can't remember. Um, then he proceeds to go on to tell me something else. He's taught, he goes on to tell me about the time that we were stationed at Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana. I believe it's a guard base now, but we went to Grissom Air Force Base would have been, I think, 1985, we left California. My mother married him, we left California. And they had a very quick wedding. Like, he met my mother and like two weeks later proposed to her. Um, so anyway, we go to Grissom and apparently while we were stationed at Grissom, again, I had no idea as a kid. I thought we were, we were told we were peons, we didn't have a pot to piss in, all true. Um, 
He goes on to tell me that while at Grissom, he was recruited by a special ops outfit. And he eventually he said no because he didn't want to be away from his wife and his kids. Y'all, he was never home growing up. He was never home growing up. So fast forward back to 2022, August of 2022, I stumble on some inconvenient truths with my former spouse and how he, he was connected with the federal government and my whistleblower case. And something very, very strange happened when I was apprehended by the cops. Now they came and they arrested me on the third day but they came two days prior back to back. And I told them both days, I am ty terrified, please leave me alone. You're freaking me out. I want to be left alone. I don't want my spouse to find me, that kind of thing. And each time I brought up my stepfather's name, we don't want to hear his stepfather's name. Don't say his name. They did not want to hear his name. It was the strangest fucking thing. And as I began to unravel what my former spouse had been hiding from me, that's when I said, oh, fuck. I didn't know, despite having been military for two plus decades by that point and retired, I did not know that when, <laughs> when they said, oh, I didn't get the job, that that meant they got the job. Um, now, can I prove it? No, I can't. I mean, I, uh, my stepfather's a piece of shit, so he could just as easily say, I never said that to her, and I never said that about my parents. I, it, so it's like, whatever, it's his word against mine. I know what I heard. And looking back, I will say this, looking back, it makes a lot of fucking sense. I rem even in the military, I remember hearing digs from people from other branches like, oh, we, we had to clean. My, oh, my mom was a Marine. We had to clean and she ran the house like a drill sergeant and stuff like that. And I'd be like, uh, I'd be like, lighten up. <laughs> it happens in Air Force homes too. Yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Like my, my stepfather was always honest. We had to... I called it scrubbing the atoms. That's what my sisters and I called it when we would clean. We had to white glove inspection clean everything and um, work first, play later. Great advice, awesome advice. Probably not super duper appropriate for children who should be playing though. Um, hmm. Yeah, made a lot of sense. Now, to this day, I don't know I don't know what organization he was with. Um, I do suspect that it is probably something very elite. I now remember this is all hindsight that I'm reflecting back on. Um, in 2009, he would have been about 27 years active duty. He retired as an E-9, a chief in, in the active duty Air Force. And um, I remember he had been recruited by Merck, Merck's fleet management up in, oh, is it Plymouth meeting, I think? He was recruited by Merck, or one of the pharmaceuticals, but I'm pretty sure it was Merck. And um, he was recruited by a couple of places, including a, um, a pest control company, a regional pest control company. Emphasis on pest control. Um, he never went to an interview. He received a call that said, hey, we want you. Come and work for us. My stepfather kept a very low profile growing up. Like if you, if you saw my stepfather at the grocery store, you might notice him because he's very physically fit or was the last time I saw him. I would even say that he probably would have qualified for like elite athlete status. Um, always very physically fit growing up. Um, but he keeps a very, I mean, I knew at 10 years old what low profile meant. 
Um, he, cause that's what I would keep a low profile. Yeah. Something you need to tell a 10 year old. Thanks. <laughs> um, anyway, too long. Didn't read. And with my former spouse, I found out about his, I received a piece of correspondence from Mike Waltz's office. It was from the the Department of Human Services, but the signature block was from Mike Waltz, my representative, because apparently for that district, they take care of that program. Um, and in the body of the correspondence, They described my former spouse as an elite operator. They said that he was on a, he just returned from a dangerous mission. I remember reading this. It would have been about late June of 2022, early July, 2022. And I didn't like, it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me that I should never have seen that piece of paperwork. What did occur to me as I read it, I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm retired and they still can't get it right. They still think my former spouse, or at that point it was we were married, I was like, they still think my husband's a sponsor and I'm the fucking dependipotamus. <laughs> That's what occurred to me. I, I don't even think I brought it up to my former spouse. at that. In fact, I didn't. I know I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think two figs over it. I, I was just like, okay, great, a typo, because they're never going to accord me the decency and respect of having served 20 plus years. <laughs> yeah, I was not supposed to see that correspondence. And in fact, it would have been about 20, right after we moved into our first home together that we bought in 2019, he started tracking the mail. I didn't know that was a thing. I just remember very suddenly he would send me a text while he was on the road like, hey, check the mailbox. We got a pe we got something delivered. It's X, Y, Z. And I remember asking him, how do you know that we got mail delivered? Oh, there's, there's this app or this program you can sign up for on USPS. And that might be very true and well, you know. But in hindsight, was he controlling the mail because he didn't want me to come across some inconvenient um, correspondence? Like the one that I got from Mike Walter's office? <laughs> Oops. It, that, that was a... It, it had Mike Waltz's signature block somewhere on the paperwork, but it was dispensed by the Social Security Administration. It came out in an SSA report... <laughs> that my former spouse was a masked operator. Had no clue, had no clue. Um, he wouldn't confirm it. His immediate response is you're crazy, um, which to me is okay, you don't even wanna know why I'm asking. You just went straight to I'm crazy. You don't even wanna know. Like to me, an appropriate response would be like, why would you even ask that? That's or like laugh even, but no, straight to you're crazy. Um, that was pretty much all the confirmation I needed. Um, I was always under the impression that he'd never served a day in the military. He is a German national. Um, that's what I'd been told. I had to disclose it on my SF-86 for my TSSCI. Uh, I don't know. He, to this day, to this day, I still don't know what, what organization... I think the report said that he was even an officer. It was either an 04, an 03, or an E8. I can't remember. I know that's kind of a big spread. But uh, I just, again, when I got the correspondence, didn't think twice. It just said, okay, great. Couldn't be the woman. Couldn't be the person with the vagina who's the veteran. <laughs> that's where my fucking mind went. Um, when so funny, early September 2022. <laughs> no, that hindsight, that little trip down memory lane via hindsight. Ooh, that was fucking whiplash for the ages, y'all. 
Anyway, I got more stuff I want to talk about, but I might can it and just call it a day. Yeah, I think I'm gonna call it a day. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna call it a day. I'm pretty sleepy and I, I'm, I'm hoping to take Huckleberry out. But anyway, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and pop off the radar. Let's, ooh, I got three notifications. Uh-oh, did somebody call me fat and ugly today? Let's find out. It's a good thing I'm not working to be a supermodel. Oh, oh, so Bobby Kennedy and Nicole Shanahan have announced that they are going to sue Meta. I found out today about several hours ago, um, about several, about six hours ago, I'm looking at it, it says six hours, six H. Uh, we at American Values 2024 are taking legal action against Meta for censoring our film, Who is Bobby Kennedy? Our documentary, Who is Bobby Kennedy? Shedding light on RFK Jr.'s true persona and his campaign to become the next president of the United States is being censored by Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram under dubious claims of violating community guidelines. Oh, they're absolutely right. What's exactly what's going on? Call it, call it for what it is. This is nothing to thumb your nose at. What Mark Zuckerberg is doing is antithetical, completely antithetical to democracy in every conceivable fucking manner. Um, violating community guidelines. Fuck you, Mark Zer Zuckerberg. Zerker. <laughs> Zuckerberg. <laughs> um, our legal complaint includes this statement. In violation of the First Amendment of civil rights laws dating back to the Civil War and of the American people's fundamental right to a presidential election decided by voters... Not by Mark Zuckerberg, not by Bill Gates, not by the Aspen Institute, not by the CIA. Decided by voters. Hi, Mark. Yeah, the great equalizer. Democracy. Welcome to it. Um, and of the American people's fundamental rights, sorry, I shut off, to a presidential election decided by voters not by trillion dollar corporations, Meta Platforms is brazenly censoring speech supportive of independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yes, they are. I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. I could, I, I wish I could have said it as eloquently myself. Um, despite being shadow banned and mislabeled as misinformation, the film triumphs on X with over 25 million views. I didn't see that earlier. That's amazing. Love X. Um, showcasing RFK Jr.'s fight against environmental corruption and misguided public narratives. As we stand at the crossroads of democracy and oligarchy, our law state challenges the giants of Silicon Valley to uphold the sanctity of political discourse. This isn't just... This isn't just about one film. It's a fight for the very soul of our public square. It is. And if if we let this go, if we if we allow Mark Zuckerberg to defile that which cannot be defiled, an inalienable right is that which cannot be defiled. Mark Zuckerberg is not fucking God, y'all. He might think he is, but he ain't. He's a little basic bitch who's got his fucking nuts in a vice-like grip called Hillary Clinton's fucking hand because he did something bad while he was at Harvard. What did Mark Zuckerberg do allegedly at Harvard that helped people like Hillary Clinton and the Aspen Institute and the CIA develop a character assassination dossier on him? Guys... Mark dabbled in non-consensual images. Yeah. It turns out that some of those images, not a lot, but some, enough. If it's one, if it's at least one, it's one too many, but some of those images were minors. Yeah. Not so tough, are you, Mark? Yeah. You're a fucking coward. 
you're a fucking coward. You would rather pander to the abuse of the Clintons and Bill Gates than acquiesce to the kindness and compassion of American citizens who, yeah, it's a shitty thing to do to benefit from something like that. But guess what? If you just come out and said, hey, the reason I've been going along with the CIA and the Aspen Institute and NATO and the, the DNC and the Biden White House is because they, they've they got some fodder on me and I'm terrified about what Americans are going to think and what Americans are going to do. Mark Zuckerberg, you should get out and meet more people like me. You would be surprised about how forgiving we can be. We, we do not tend to be violent. That's something that you guys do. Sure, you might hire people from backgrounds like mine, you know, the bronze of the world to refer to Game of Thrones again, but that's something you guys do. People like me, when we're pissed off at somebody, we just say blah, 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 and we move on. So yeah, if Americans were made aware of your mistakes and your errors and your transgressions as a human being, yeah, they're gonna, they're going to recoil a bit. That's human nature. But you aren't gonna find a lot of people like me running to your house in Palo Alto, wherever your fucking dumbass lives, with pitchforks. We, it's not that deep, dude. It's not that deep. That's something you guys do. So stop projecting what you guys do onto people like me. We just say what we have to say, and for the most part, we either move on or we're forced to move on. Oh my God, Mark Zuckerberg. Shame on you, dude. Shame on you. Um, when social media companies censor a presidential candidate, the public can't learn what that candidate actually believes and what policies they would pursue if elected. Yes, and this hits home for me right now. I know I said I was going to jump off here a few minutes ago, but I kind of got all heated up. Um, this hits home for me right now because even though I'm a big fan of X, and I think X has been wildly successful in many of their endeavors, the fact of the matter is my friends and family are still on Facebook. You know, they just, they're not... They don't get that vibe from X yet that their demographic is wanted or needed, um, which sucks because I, I see what Elon Musk is doing and I think that, not I think, I, I know my friends in general would respond very favorably to that. So um, do I think it's going to be permanent? Absolutely not. I think it's going to take time, is what I think. It's going to take time. And snobbiness isn't just something that people with money do. I can be snobby too. Like, I might have an idea like, oh, that's that thing that you're complaining about is so not a big deal. But in reality, it might be a very big deal. It's just that I've never been exposed to it, so I wouldn't know. Um, so yeah, snobbiness works both ways. It's not just driven by you have money or don't have money. Yeah, that's how that works. Um, <clears throat> we are left with, oh, so my, my friends. My friends are still on Facebook, and it, it has occurred to me many, many times especially over the last few months as Bobby Kennedy's um, campaign picks up momentum and speed. Ooh, check that out. That's bitchin'. I wonder if there's a... Let me, let me look at the radar really fast. I'm a little tired weather forecaster. Oh, this is sick. This is sick. Look at that fucking line. Oh my God. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so, my friends are not getting the exposure to content, content that I'm getting on X. Um, 
And that makes me sad because I want them to see Bobby Kennedy's content. Uh, the campaign manager for the Kennedy Shanahan campaign is doing a fabulous job of informing concerned Americans, of garnering the interest and faith of what I would say a wandering demographic, which is most of America. Like, there's a very big wandering demographic, and Bobby Kennedy and Nicole Shanahan get that. And they're invested in trying to bring us into the fold. So, I, yeah, obviously I want my friends to see that fucking documentary. Are you kidding me? But then what's the point of posting it on Facebook if it's going to be censored? And I know for a fact that F Facebook has censored my content in particular. I talked about a litmus test. Uh, many of my friends are medics. And I knew when Neuralink came out with the update on the, was he, uh, the quadriplegic patient who was able to use telepathy to play video games, I knew my friends, not even just my medic friends, I knew in general, but especially the medic types, they were gonna be like, oh my God, that's so cool. Not even a like. That told me everything I needed to know. That was absolutely suppressed. Like, I do I need to write into Facebook and be like, hey, I think you suppressed this post, and here's what, no. I don't, I don't need Mark Zuckerberg's permission to make a self-evident observation. Poop comes out of his hiney hole the same way it comes out of mine. I'm not going to say the same thing about peeing, though. Yeah, or maybe I could. He does act like a pussy. So, yeah, maybe he does have a pussy. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, really, really want my friends to see the same content that I'm being ex... ex exposed to on X, especially about Bobby Kennedy, because Trump, don't sit there and think Trump is some kind of fucking angel. Trump has made this about himself. Trump is wasting my time and your time by mocking Joe Biden. I can mock Joe Biden without your donations. I don't need your donations. I don't need your vote to mock Joe Biden. I can do that for free. I can go on X and do that live. I can go on YouTube and hope that it doesn't get suppressed and do that live. I can't do it on Facebook because Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. <laughs> um, good thing she has little hands. <laughs> oh, tornado warning. Fuck. Well, I better get going. I'm going to pop off here. I'm sure everything's fine. All right, you guys have a good one. Bye.